Today we're talking about the WTO, a group that's kind of like the Illuminati of geopolitics. Globalists think it's conspiring against them, small countries think it's conspiring against them, and guys who wear tinfoil hats and follow shelters, well, I'm sure they've got blogs dedicated to just this group. In reality, it's basically the UN of global trade, although it has a little more bite because you can use it to sue people, which has a little more impact than a strongly worded note. Its goal is to promote free trade, and with that, I think you can probably guess why we're talking about it today. China and the European Union are among those not only protesting President Trump's steel and aluminum tariffs, but now demanding official WTO intervention. But does the WTO have teeth anymore when it comes to resolving these burgeoning trade battles? It's going absolutely crazy right now with the World Trade Organization. I mean, we have 40 countries objecting at the WTO for our car tariff ban. The European Union, India, China, and Russia all have applied to the World Trade Organization to challenge the US tariffs. And now in a fun little twist, it was recently announced that the US has launched 5 WTO challenges to retaliatory tariffs against us. So a lot of things are flying around right now, and most people think that the US might not win these cases, which is now leading people to ask. So should, the, should America continue to waste its time with the WTO? Should we leave the WTO? Like they always say, if you can't beat them, leave them. This isn't just an idea floating around either. Two weeks ago, a proposal leaked from the White House that Trump directed staffers to research and create a bill to abandon WTO rules. To understand exactly what each party thinks about this, I decided to check in with the reporting from both Fox News and MSNBC. So let's start with Fox News because, and I'm not sure why, but they talk about the WTO infinitely more than MSNBC. Now this first guy, I'm not sure what's going on here, but it seems like he practiced his talking points in the mirror and decided to spit them all out in the first 15 seconds of the interview. And President Trump's view is very simple. It's dysfunctional and it takes too long to process claims. To your point that you had a situation with the Canadian dairy claim that was in the early 2000s and we still don't have a solution on that. With respect to China, the problem is China doesn't have most favored nation status and basically gets to play by the rules of a third, you know, a third world island nation like Barbuda when it comes to lodging complaints against the U.S. and back and forth. Whew, that's a lot of information to take in fast. So let's look at those problems one at a time. First we have the efficiency and dysfunctionality claim. And no doubt they're dysfunctional right now. We set fire to the house and now we're complaining about how hot it is. More to the point though, these Canadian dairy tariffs. Currently Canada has these tariffs that are at as free trade as any thought that's crossed through Donald Trump's mind in the past few months. Canada's supply management system sets quotas for dairy, eggs, and poultry and charges high tariffs above that threshold. I guess you could say they're trying to protect their dairy industry because it's a cash cow. Sorry about that. These high tariffs are really high too. Canada blocks imports from other countries including the US by imposing tariffs of up to 270% on dairy products. Yeah, we'll let you sell in our market, we're just gonna more than triple the price. That's fair, right? Here's the thing. You can't blame the WTO for this one because we haven't brought up a case any time recently or complained with the WTO, which is a pretty big part of the process. It's like getting mad at the mailman because your friend never wrote you back. We did fight hard against this in the NAFTA negotiations, but that's a completely separate institution. In a quest for truth, I dug deeper and I found an obscure case filed with the WTO in 1997. DS-103, have fun remembering that. Because the WTO is quite a speedy organization, this case was argued 6 years later in 2003. Basically the US, Argentina, Australia, European communities, Japan, and Mexico all joined together to sue the Canadian dairy system. Huh, I guess in 2003 Bush could really create a coalition on something. We ended up settling though and haven't brought it up since, despite the fact that we could. He did mention that, but then again a graph comes up that kind of disproves the statement. You had a situation with the Canadian dairy claim that was in the early 2000s and we still don't have a solution on that. With respect to China, the problem is China doesn't- He's right, we still don't have a solution to it. 
Oh, never mind. Well, I'm glad I didn't go on national TV and report that one as fact. Now to the second point. <laughs> With respect to China, the problem is China doesn't have most favored nation status and basically gets to play by the rules of a third, you know, a third world island nation like Barbuda when it comes to lodging complaints against the U.S. and back and forth. All right, so China doesn't have preferred nation status, and that's a bad thing because they're treated like a third world country. Well, that sounds kind of unfair for China. So what's the problem? Well, the first problem is, and this is the first time I'm going to do this on this show, but that's a straight up lie. On December 27th, 2001, the People's Republic of China, aka Red China or just plain old China, was granted the status of permanent normal trade relations with the United States, a label formerly known as most favored nation status. All right, so they are the most favored nation. And when I started looking into that, well, that might have been an opinion in Trump's opinion that was the single worst decision by any president ever. And in this case, maybe not an exaggeration. It basically opened up our markets to China and said that we could not apply tariffs unreasonably. Between 2000, when they became a most favored nation, to 2015, US imports from China more than quadrupled as a result, leading to declines in manufacturing jobs. While this interview was interesting, I'm quickly realizing that almost nothing that guy said was accurate. Here's a better reason to leave. How might you have ruled on the steel and aluminum tariff dispute right now? Uh, the United States is bound to lose all the cases that are being brought against it uh, by other countries uh, arising from the steel and aluminum tariffs. That is no small thing, because if we lose those cases, we could be put on the hook for paying out all of the financial losses caused by those tariffs. And well, if you watch the news, that's quite a bit of money. So I guess just walk away? Now to be clear, after reviewing WTO rules, this would not have to come in the form of cash. It could also be a tariff reduction to reverse the effects. But still, we're not really picking from a good pool of options here. It's like going to IOP to find your soulmate. Another thing to think about is, under WTO rules, US goods and services are dramatically less likely to face discrimination, high tariffs, predatory pricing, and protectionist treatment in international markets. Right now, we have this institution protecting us, but if we leave, it's up to us to do that. I mean, it's not terrible, we didn't have the WTO until 1995, but it's just a hassle. Especially for me, a guy who summarized trade wars so many times recently, I talk about VAT taxes in my sleep. It's never all I have to say about that anymore. To provide a little more perspective on leaving the WTO, there was recently a leaked bill. This, as Axios has exclusively obtained, a leaked Trump administration bill that would essentially blow up the World Trade Organization. So this bill introduces the United States Fair and Reciprocal Tariff Act, and basically says we're going to ignore all WTO rules giving Trump unilateral power to negotiate one-on-one -on -one with other countries, which is either a good or a bad thing depending on whether you think he's actually read the art of the deal or not. The specific rules we'd be breaking are, first, the most favored nation principle that countries can't set different tariff rates for different countries outside of free trade agreements. This would allow us to negotiate one-on-one -on -one tariffs with China, because they are a most favored nation. Sorry, I'm still a little bit salty about that one because I ended up going down a complicated rabbit hole. Now, you might be saying to yourself, Stephen, we already put tariffs on China. How do we do it? Well, China and the WTO would probably say illegally, but the steel and aluminum tariffs were put in citing a somewhat obscure 1968 National Security Act on imports of such important components for war and the additional tariffs were put in as part of an investigation into IP theft. Leaving the WTO means that we could now put on tariffs arbitrarily. The other rule we wouldn't mind ignoring is the bound tariff rates, the tariff ceilings that each WTO member has agreed to in previous negotiations. Basically, you can't impose a tariff above a previously agreed upon percentage. Now, this gets really complicated really fast as you go through each product type in detail. And I could tell you all that, but wouldn't it just be simpler to burn it all down so we could do arbitrary tariffs as large as we wanted? If you think this is a bad thing though, don't worry, 
Here's MSNBC. They don't think it'll pass, at least most of them, apart from uh, Peter Navarro, his trade advisor. Um, we actually have reporting that Mark Short, the legislative affairs director, had told Peter Navarro um, a few months back when they were discussing this bill that this is dead on arrival. There's zero chance Congress would ever pass this. Ah, tough break, Trump. But don't worry, I'm sure we can look through 243 years of laws and find some old racist 18th century tariff laws that we can bring back to legally impose them. For national security, we will never buy galleons from a filthy Italian. He has shown a lack of understanding oh. about how trade works, how tariffs work. And I, I believe, isn't it true that the rules he's actually trying to avoid have helped lower tariffs and protect U.S. trade? What, well, if anything, could he be trying to gain in passing a bill like this other than autonomy to do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. Love that report because it's less of a report and more of a mix of insults and obvious statements. Wait, you're telling me that the World Trade Organization likes world trade? Next you'll be telling me that the Environmental Protection Agency likes environmental protection. Yes, the WTO's entire existence is based on lowering tariffs, which is good for global trade and good for consumers, but not manufacturers in America. Secondly, can you name a reason he would want to do this beyond autonomy? Well, that's like asking can you name a reason someone would go into finance beyond money. I do it to feel good about what I'm doing on this planet and hang out with just a bunch of great douchebags. Furthermore, recently, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce today is unveiling an, a new campaign to go after President Trump's trade policies because in the end they say it will cost U.S. consumers. Our transition from a farming to a manufacturing to a service-based economy has had huge effects on what we prioritize as a nation. So some economists are arguing that to protect our objectively small manufacturing industry and sacrifice our bread and butter service and IT industries, it's going to raise prices because that's what happens when you charge more for imports as well as leading to a shrinking of our service industry because we're making business expenses more expensive. I have done a lot of episodes on this before. But for the sake of keeping this under a few hours, let's just say that economists on both sides of the aisle, even on Fox News, agree that this path we're going down is not good, and leaving the WTO is just another step in the wrong direction. Take it from this economist who hasn't cleared his throat since the 1960s. One final reason not to leave the WTO. I, I don't think we ought to pull out of the World Trade Organization. I think we ought to backpedal on this as fast as we can and continue on free trade as fast as we can. Free trade is something that has made the United States very rich, along with many other things. We've got to remember something about the U.S., which is different from, say, France or Germany or the United Kingdom or, or, or Japan. We don't depend on, on trade for an enormous part of our gross domestic product. Those countries do. Interestingly enough, Donald Trump does have one person who agrees with his trade policies. Here he is in 1994. Mr. Speaker, multinational corporations and the big business community have launched a huge lobbying effort to preserve MFN status for China, claiming that their investments create American jobs. And in 1995... I know that the corporate media wants us to pass MFN, but nonetheless... We should do the right thing, protect American workers, protect decent paying jobs. And of course, 2005. But we should be very aware that PNTR with China is not only leading to the destruction of traditional manufacturing and blue collar jobs. It is leading to the loss of millions of high tech information technology jobs as well. Oh, and of course, campaign Bernie in 2015. They would dead wrong. Economic Policy Institute has estimated that PNTR with China has led to the loss, to the, led to the net loss of over 2. million American jobs. Well, he's consistent. That's over two decades of speeches. He was speaking out against this before I was speaking. The first two, we shouldn't do this, and the second two, told you. So who knows, maybe when they retire from politics, Sanders and Trump can get together in Queens and talk about the Chinese taking our jobs while feeding the pigeons. For now though, that's all I have to say about that. Hey YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to support independent nonpartisan comedy news, remember to subscribe and give me a like.
And as always, thank you for watching.